Okay, do you hear me well? Perfect. Yeah, so my name is Krzysztof Koromański. I'm in Google Brain Robotics team in New York, uh, also adjunct assistant professor at Columbia University. And it's my great pleasure to give this talk here. And uh, as was said, uh, I actually graduated from this department, so I have really nice memories. So it's, it's great to, to be there with you. And uh, this talk is basically, maybe like a little bit different from other talks that uh, you heard or you will hear like during this conference. Uh, uh, I will try to convince you that in machine learning, it's not uh, all about just using some black box algorithms already designed by somebody, but there is also some really cool mathematics going on. So you can really work on, on nice mathematics and develop your own, own algorithms and mathematics works in practice. Um, uh, even like in robotics, like when it's like very applied field. So the goal of this talk is actually to show to you that uh, it's not just about like applying like the, the routines that other designed and uh, kind of like add extra layers or like, um, I mean like uh, extra neural network, but you can actually get something mathematically very rich. Uh, so this is a joint work with lots of collaborators. So basically my colleagues from Google Brain Robotics team, Vikas Sintfani, Atil Ist, and Jitan, Erwin Kumans. Uh, people from University of Cambridge that I collaborate with, Mark Roland and Adrian Weller. And I uh, also actually some folks from Georgia Tech, Byron Boots and uh, CMU, Carlton Downey. So it's like really like a joint work with all these great people. Okay, so let's start. So I basically went here like almost directly from NAPES conference, which was uh, in Long Beach this year. Actually, I stopped by, by Paris, but uh, pretty much just like, for a couple of days. And yeah, it was like really nice uh, venue. I mean, I, I like California and it was a very crowded venue. I mean, like this year there was more than 20,000 uh, registered participants. So, so it was like a little crazy and actually like finding uh, a room like in the hotel, like a few days after re registration opened was almost impossible. So people who couldn't do that, like they ended up uh, pretty much right here. So there's this hotel like Queen Mary boat. Uh, that was the only like uh, hotel available like after like a couple of days. Uh, uh, I mean, I ended up like in, in another hotel, but, uh, but that was like the case. Uh, it was actually far, far away from the convention center, so not really convenient. But anyway, as I said, like uh, I, so why it's like so, so attractive, this machine learning stuff? Because now, uh, nowadays everybody, everybody can use it. Everybody can, can run this like neural network. There are so many tutorials on, on YouTube, etc. But as I said, I want to convince you that you can do also something very rich in terms of mathematics in this field. Okay, so, so let's start. Oh, yeah, one more like a uh, nice curve, yeah. It, uh, if NIPS grows like that, uh, then like uh, very soon like we'll have more participants of NIPS than uh, people like uh, on Earth. So I don't know what, what it means really, but uh, I mean, I leave it to you. Okay. <laughs> so, okay, so let's start with some cool mathematics. So, so let's assume that you have very high dimensional data and uh, we'll start like with some like very basic stuff. I mean, like one of the like coolest like lemmas that I mean, if you work on machine learning and uh, interested like more from the mathematical point of view, it's like Johnson Linus transform. So the idea is that having very high dimensional data, it's not really nice to deal with high dimensional data. So we'd like to reduce dimensionality, to preserve, but in such a way that you can preserve some signal from the original data. And the signal can be like I mean, lots of different things. Usually, we'd like to preserve some similarity measures between points like in the original data. In the easiest scenario, and that is exactly the JLT setting, um, that will be Euclidean distances. So the idea is that you'd like to lower the dimensionality, but in such a way that like in this uh, lower dimensional embedding, uh, the Euclidean distance between points will somehow approximate the Euclidean distance in the original space. And there are many standard ways in which you can do that. I mean, one obvious thing is uh, you can pretty much uh, project your data into random hyperplanes. Uh, and those hyperplanes can be actually defined by Gaussian vectors. So the very rough idea is that you select a bunch of Gaussian independent vectors and you pretty much compute dot products of your Gaussian vectors with data points. I mean, for every fixed point, you compute a bunch of these dot products and uh, just collect them all together, uh, the number of those Gaussian vectors that you use for uh, encoding each point is obviously much smaller than the dimensionality of every point because that's the whole idea of, of reducing dimensionality. And this is how you create the so-called feature map, random feature map for, for the point. So now this is like how it works from the mathematical point of view. So you have a Gaussian unstructured matrix and by N independent entries from N01. And then you just take your favorite vector Xi and dimensional and you just compute matrix vector uh, product. Uh, then you need to renormalize and that's a random feature map for, for your vector. 
So you can do it for all your vectors in your database. And now, instead of working with original n-dimensional data, you can work with this m-dimensional data. And if luckily you compute the dot product between this m-dimensional vectors, this dot product is very close to, I mean, if m is large enough, so it should be smaller than n, very close to the dot product uh, between original vectors. So the dot product signal is preserved, and you can actually think about dot product as the simplest similarity measure between points that you can think about. And in general, like the similarity measures in machine learning are called kernels. So a kernel is a function that takes two feature vectors and outputs a, a number, a similarity measure. And the simplest possible a similarity measure we can think about is a dot product. And we'll talk about more complicated uh, in a moment. So now, you know, when you have this simple, so this random feature map procedure gives you actually a very simple estimator of the dot product. You just take the corresponding random feature maps for two points, you compute the dot product of those feature maps, and that's your estimation of the dot product. So now we can think about, I mean, can ask questions like how uh, this, uh, how you can like, I mean, what about the concentration results for, for that stuff? Uh, okay, so it is unbiased. It's actually not very hard to, to show that it is unbiased. But what about the concentration, right? Like how well it's concentrated around its mean? So it's all about the, the mean squared error. And actually it's not a hard cal calculation. The mean squared error is given by this formula. So the question is, can we do better? So this is the standard, I mean, if you learn about JLT, I mean, JLT was like, uh, I mean, proved like many, many years ago, like uh, also almost like an ancient era. But, uh, but if you read about it, this is the standard way to do that. And it's actually a very simple way to do that because the random feature map here is obtained by the linear transformation. It's just a mat matrix vector uh, multiplication. So the complexity is actually n times n. Right, this is unstructured matrix, and uh, actually you can show, I mean, this MSC is given by this formula, you can actually prove some nice concentration results, and this is like already like pretty nice MSC. You see that it actually, the more features, the larger M is, the better concentration you get, which is not surprising at all. So now the question is, can you do better? And the idea is that uh, actually like instead of choosing your rows of your Gaussian matrix to be independent Gaussian vectors, what you can do instead is to, you can condition on those vectors to be pairwise orthogonal. So marginal distributions should be still Gaussian, but uh, joint distribution, uh, I mean, it's not like longer a collection of independent vectors. They are pairwise orthogonal. How you can do it, uh, so one, I mean, l let, me, let me give you some intuition why it actually works better. So this is like our NIPS paper from Barcelona, actually, from last year, when we proposed like this, uh, this setting and uh, how you can construct those orthogonal Gaussian matrices. Actually, there's a very simple rule, and you can just constru construct unstructured Gaussian matrix and do Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization of that matrix, and then you can renormalize each row so that you are sure that the length of each row is sampled from the length of the Gaussian vector. So uh, the question about how heavy it is computational-wise, we can talk about it like in a moment, but uh, it's pretty clear procedure how you can do this orthogonalization. And usually you want to do it just at the, I mean, one time. Like have your data, obviously you do not do it like uh, for any single point. This matrix is fixed for entire data set. So this one time extra cost like is acceptable like if it leads to better concentration results. So why you can think about, I mean, why it should work better. So the very rough idea is that you know, if you have unstructured Gaussian vectors, then that you do not condition on them to be orthogonal, you do not really evenly explore the space. So it must, might be the case that, uh, you know, the dot product between uh, those vectors is actually close to uh, uh, zero, but it's not exactly zero. And uh, you're not evenly exploring the space, you're kind of like wasting your resources. Uh, on the other hand, if you condition on them to be exactly orthogonal, the marginal distributions are still Gaussian, then you really explore the space like in an even way. And because the marginal distributions are Gaussian, then in particular you have this isotropic property that all directions are equally likely like to, uh, to be realized. So that's the very rough idea. And actually you can use, I mean, as we'll see later, this idea not just for the dimensionality reduction setup, but also to approximate other kernels, more complicated nonlinear kernels, and also like a nice robotics application so when you want to uh, sense the gradient of the function and learn some policies of an agent like in the reinforcement learning setup. But that's the very rough idea. So you have the uh, orthogonalized version of, the, of this un unstructured matrix, and that's pretty much it. Everything else is the same. So now, as I said before, the problem with this is that you have this one-time extra cost. Uh, what if you do not want this one-time extra cost? What if you would like something that is actually faster than baseline and also more accurate than baseline? I mean, better mean squared error. 
So it seems that we are looking kind of like for a free lunch theorem. Uh, it should be impossible, but actually it's possible like to, to do that. So for dimensionality reduction, this is our NIPS paper from this year. You can actually come up with estimators that are more accurate. So the variance is smaller, actually not, not just about the variance, but uh, let's just focus on variance right now. And also it's actually much faster to compute those random feature maps. So how you can do it? So the very rough idea is that instead of using this Gaussian orthogonal matrices, let's just use some discrete structures. Uh, the structure discrete matrices that will give you computational speed ups, matrix vector multiplication done like in subquadratic time, but at the same time, hopefully you will have good uh, concentration or even better concentration. And the simplest way to do it is to use the product of the HD matrices, where H is a Hadamard matrix, and D is a random diagonal matrix with uh, non-zero entries taken independently at random from plus one, minus one uh, to the element set. So Hadamard matrix is basically, I mean, the most general definition is you would like, it's a matrix with entries taken from two element set plus one, minus one, and uh, the rows should be, actually want the rows and columns to be uh, different, rows and columns to be pairwise orthogonal. Uh, it's actually, this is an example like of the Hadamard matrix. So those black pixels correspond to ones, the white pixels correspond to minus ones. There are many different ways in which you can construct Hadamard matrices. And uh, actually lots of those constructions are based on recurrent uh, formula. And this is one of those recurrent formulas. So basically the idea here is that like you kind of like copy the square, but the, the fourth time you copy it, you switch the whites when, uh, with blacks and blacks and with whites, and you can just continue. And so it's actually very easy to prove that if you start with an orthogonal matrix and you continue the process, like you will have an orthogonal matrix uh, at every single step. So it's a very simple construction, and actually the good news is that if you have a Hadamard matrix, multiplication of the Hadamard matrix by a vector can be actually done in n log n time using a fast watch Hadamard transform. So we actually don't even need to store explicitly in memory your Hadamard matrix. I mean, like this computation can be d uh, done on the fly. Now, of course, there are also random uh, diagonal matrices, but that is a piece of cake, right? Because, I mean, this multiplication can be done in linear time, it's trivial. So actually what you can do on this diagonal, I said that you can uh, do plus one, minus one business, but you can actually do something more fancy if you want to be cool. And uh, one way to do it is so you can uh, actually sample elements on the diagonals from the complex plane, from the unit circle in the complex plane. Or like if you want to be less cool, but still like better than plus one or minus one, you can uh, do something like discrete stuff, like plus one, minus one, plus i, minus i. And, uh, and actually it gives you like uh, extra accuracy, which is not kind of like surprising because uh, you know, using complex number, you actually like uh, use more budget of randomness. But there's actually more than this. So there is some uh, subtle like effect that those complex number give you that is not just about like, uh, uh, I mean, increasing the budget of randomness. I don't, I'm not sure whether I will have time to talk about it. But anyway, that's the way to do it. Of course, if you use those matrices, those uh, diagonal became like complex matrices. So at some point, like you will need to take the real part of the estimate, I mean, to get the estimator. But anyway, I mean, let's not go into details right now. So just to summarize, so this S, okay, so this block SDI, so this is basically, think about S as a Hadamard matrix and the I's are random diagonal independent matrices. And uh, so the base estimator is given by this formula with GX business. Then you can do Gram-Schmidt orthogonalization to get uh, estimator that have strictly smaller MSC. Uh, but this requires this one time additional extra cost. Or you can do the product of K, S, D, K, S, D, I blocks where S is, S is a Hadamard matrix. And then you get an estimator that is actually more accurate than the uh, standard baseline. And this is actually the, the formula, the exact formula for the variance, or the mean squared error, because it's an bias estimator. And the nice thing is that it's actually, I mean, you don't see it probably here, but you can actually pretty uh, easily prove like from this formula that uh, this would be like strictly smaller than what you get for the baseline. So, so actually like this very nice story like with this stuff. So we had like the first version of that theorem just for three blocks and it took like, I don't know, like 20 pages or so to, to prove it. And then I came up with like a simplification of the method and actually managed to extend it like for arbitrary number of blocks. What is interesting from this formula, it also explains you some nice uh, uh, observations that were done empirically before. So this HDI constructions were used, for instance, in the LSH setting, like in machine learning, to pretty much do some like hashing, like, uh, I mean, faster than like with Gaussian matrices. And, uh, and the nice thing about it is that uh, you can actually prove that in practice, three blocks HD are enough to obtain good accuracy. And actually, like, 
odd number of blocks is better than even. And somehow it's expressed by this, uh, by this formula. So we have a telescopic formula here. If you look like more carefully, you can actually compare like the 2K plus one blocks with 2K, 2K blocks and see what's going on with the MSE. So it kind of like explains like partially why this nice weird phenomenon that, uh, I mean, odd number of blocks should be in general better than even. But anyway, I mean, this formula gives you like an exact, uh, it's just like an exact expression of the MSE. So now, you know, the question is, if you use this SDI stuff, you'd like to, at some point, I mean, we are doing dimensionality reduction, so you would like to sample some rows, like of the last block, to obtain a lower dimensional vector. How you can do it? I mean, there are lots of very simple strategies that you can use. Uh, first time rows, last time rows. You can sample rows with repetitions or without repetitions. The formula that I gave there was sampling without repetitions. Obviously, it seems to be better. I mean, you do not want to waste resources. The problem with sampling uh, with or without repetitions is that you break the structure of the light last matrix, so you cannot really take care, I mean, take advantage of the wa fast wash Hadamard transfer for the last computation. But in practice, the first or M last row work extremely well. I mean, that's pretty much the same accuracy as for M rows without repetitions. And then you do not break the structure, so you have N log N business, pretty much a free lunch stuff. Uh, linear space uh, complexity versus quadratic. You do not need to store the Hadamard matrix in uh, memory. You just need to store the bits of the diagonal matrices. So pretty much you have like KN bits to store and that's it. Uh, that's uh, your description of the, of the estimator. And uh, yeah, it's like linear space complexity versus quadratic and actually it's also more accurate. Okay, so if we go to uh, more interesting um, similarity measures, then we need to go to, uh, to more, I mean, nonlinear kernels. And you know, I want to give you some intuition like regarding neural nets. So if you have a neural network, and I tell you that, uh, okay, the first layer is, uh, is a random layer. So you have like random Gaussian weights, and then you apply some nonlinearity. That will actually correspond to the PNG kernel, point uh, nonlinear Gaussian kernel. An example of that is actually this kernel right here. So here we are talking about the angular kernel, but think about F as some nonlinear mapping. It can be like a linear rectifier, it can be tang H or whatever you want. So and W will be actually uh, a Gaussian matrix. So this is what, what W is. In this setting for the angular kernel, the nonlinear mapping is given by the sine function, like in the neural network setting with like linear rectifier or like sigmoid or, or anything else. So these kernels are very much related to, to neural networks. Of course, the difference here is that you do not learn W. The W is a random matrix. In neural network, you, you want to like in general uh, learn. So what you can prove about this kernel, you can pretty much use the same trick that we use for dimensionality reduction. So instead of using uh, Gaussian unstructured matrices, you can actually impose structure by doing orthogonalization, or you can even replace Gaussian matrices by some structured discrete constructions at the HD uh, case. And you can actually prove the similar stuff. With orthogonalization, the concentration is better. The mean squared error actually goes down. And what is actually very interesting is that the proof that we got for that it's uh, completely different from the proof that we got for dimensionality reduction setup. So kind of the conclusion is pretty much the same, orthogonality helps, but somehow the proof is completely different. So we are a little like, I mean, not completely like satisfied by that stuff because it means that probably we are missing something. Like we all like, uh, would like to look for the proof from the book, right? That will like explain like all those different special cases, uh, but we don't know how to do it. So, so this proof is like very geometric and it's actually very different from the dimensionality reduction, as I said. The angular kernel here is actually defined by this formula. So, I mean, it has something to do with angle, like as um, in the uh, definition of the kernel. And it's actually like a linear function of angle between two vectors. So it has something to do with the cosine distance. If you are, if you have really vectors like that are like in unit sphere, then you are more interested uh, in the cosine distance or the angular distance than other distances probably. And the fact that you can actually uh, approximate these kernels with random feature maps, uh, I mean, let's talk about the unstructured setting right now, comes from this nice property that the Gaussian distribution is isotropic. So basically the idea is that if I give you two vectors, x and y, and I propose uh, the following estimator, so that's my estimator right there. So you pretty much, uh, what you do, you are sampling Gaussian vectors, and you are computing the, the sine of uh, G transpose X times the sine of G transpose Y, and then averaging over M samples. Then the question is really when you get plus one or when you get minus one. So when like, uh, you know, those two, pro those two um, expressions agree, 
in terms of sign and when they do not disagree. And this has something to do like with the, when the projection of the Gaussian vector that you are using for the sampling ends like in this like the two dimensional uh, plane that is spanned by X and Y. And it turns out that it needs to be like in one of these two pieces of pizza in order like to have different signs. So now the projection of the Gaussian vector on a fixed like two dimensional or K dimensional linear subspace is also a Gaussian vector. So now you have this isotropic distribution still. And obviously the probability will be proportional to the total angle like of that uh, business right here. So it's like two theta over two pi, theta over pi then, and that's pretty much you can easily like compute the, uh, the, uh, uh, the estimate. I mean the, the fact that you can prove that the, it's, uh, it's unbiased. Now, uh, the interesting thing is that if you impose orthogonality, it turns out that in order to prove that the estimator is actually strictly better in terms of the mean squared error, the only thing that you need to prove is that it's pretty much you are looking for, you are interested in, in a particular event, in an event that uh, uh, one, that the vector that you are using for sampling, the, the Gaussian vector, uh, has uh, one dot product with one of the vectors with one sign and the other vector with the completely different sign. So now, so you are like interesting in those events and you just want to show that the probability, if you take two vectors, two Gaussian vectors, G1 and G2 that you use for the sampling and the corresponding uh, events A and B, the probability of the uh, intersection of these events has to be strictly smaller than the intersection of probabilities. That basically turns out that it, it gives you a smaller MSE. So now, how you can do it, I mean, here like in this two-dimensional case, it's pretty, pretty simple. I mean, basically you want to say that if one of those, if, if you condition of one of those vectors to be in one of those two slices of pizza, it's much harder for the other vector to be one in one of the two slices of pizza. Whereas if you do not condition, if they're completely independent, it's actually simpler. So it is very intuitive like in a two-dimensional scenario and that was kind of, kind of like our intuition when we started working on the problem. Obviously everything is, uh, becomes more complicated when you uh, work in the high-dimensional space. Because when you are like working in a very high-dimensional space, I mean of course you still take projections of the Gaussian vectors into two-dimensional space, but the Gaussian vectors that you start with are almost uh, orthogonal to this uh, hyperspace. So it's kind of the effect is uh, much smaller and it's not like surprising, right? Because uh, I mean, if dimensionality is like very large, this effect like should be, should be smaller. But anyway, you can still prove it rigorously and there's actually a very nice geometric proof for that. Uh, yeah, so pretty much uh, this is what we are interested in. Okay, so, you know, in machine learning, uh, the kernels that are probably more interesting, the similarity measures that more are most interesting are uh, the RBF kernels, right, the basis function kernels. And those are basically, they have this like nice property that uh, the value of the similarity function, the value of the kernel depends just of the length of the difference between the input feature vectors, x and y. So a standard example is a Gaussian kernel that is like used like, I mean, if, if we are talking about kernels like in machine learning, like, I mean, Gaussian is probably the most popular one. So the nice story about uh, radial basis function kernels and I mean, general shift invariant kernels is that uh, you can actually encode the value of the kernel by this nice formula. So uh, this is what's called Bochner's theorem. It basically says that uh, the kernel can be, it's nothing else but some expectation of some random variable. I mean, this expectation is encoded in this integral. I mean, you can forget right now about this like complex business right here. So now, of course, you know, the question is, if we have something like this, then, you know, the standard way, I mean, going uh, about approximating these kernels is trying to approximate the, the integral computation and how you can do it, like with some Monte Carlo business, right? So, so this is exactly what uh, random features for Gaussian kernels are doing. They're using this formula for, for the kernel and they say, okay, this is just an integral that we'd like to approximate. Let's just do it in an unbiased way using random features, but those random features are exactly Monte Carlo. This is exactly Mo Monte Carlo procedure. So you assemble a bunch of points and you are just computing the value of the function and then you are averaging over these points. That's pretty much it. So now the interesting thing is that, uh, so yeah, these are some examples of those RBF kernels, the, the Gaussian y, uh, one. So the positive definite function phi that is associated to this kernel is defined by this formula. There are like, uh, I mean, many others, Matern, Laplace, but Gaussian is probably the most popular. And the co corresponding Fourier densities, so those Fourier densities are basically, so if you look like into this expression right here on the right-hand side, I mean, you can think about it, so this mu is some probabilistic measure. So you can really think about it as, um, 
as an expectation of a random variable e to i w dot product w x minus y. And uh, the expectation is, uh, uh, I mean, for every kernel, every, R every RBF kernel, like you have the corresponding probabilistic measure when you are working with. So this is exactly the density of that measure. So for the Gaussian kernel, the nice thing is that the corresponding density is the Gaussian density. For other kernels, it's, it's not that nice. It's like, I mean, you need to like calculate it, uh, and sometimes it's like pretty tricky to, to do it. Okay, so the nice thing is that, and actually that is like our recent uh, submission, um, is the observation that uh, there is some nice connection between RBF kernels and completely monotone functions. So, and actually this uh, connection enables us to come up like with better way of uh, approximating this kernel that using standard uh, random feature maps. So the connection is given by completely monotone functions. So that's the definition of the completely monotone function. So it's pretty much something like about the, I mean, derivatives like uh, uh, of that function, like they should have like uh, a certain signs. And the nice theorem, I mean, it's not our theorem, it's like, uh, it's an old theorem actually by Schoenberg from 38, says that uh, there is like, I mean, every uh, positive definite function, and I should say that uh, this phi must be positive definite if, uh, if we are talking about kernels, because kernel like should satisfy this, this property, can be actually described in terms of the co completely monotone function, and this is what this theorem says. So why it turns out to be pretty useful? Because when we started working with these Gaussian kernels, um, obviously, you know, what you can do is you can look for standard ways to approximate it with like standard Monte Carlo procedures where we pretty much sample Gaussian vectors uh, independently at random. Why Gaussian? Because the corresponding uh, Fourier measures and Gaussian measures. So you have Gaussian uh, distributions, uh, but you can do it independently. But, uh, you know, the other way to think about it is you can try to use some quasi-Monte Carlo business, right? And the quasi-Monte Carlo business, the whole idea is that your samples are not independent. They are somehow dependent and you would like to get more accurate estimators. And that's actually exactly what we can do also with this orthogonal feature. So now if you think about um, conditioning on the Gaussian vectors to be exactly orthogonal, then you are really doing some quasi-Monte Carlo stuff instead of doing like standard Monte Carlo stuff. And that's exactly what we, what we tried, but of course the question is whether we can prove something about it. So, you know, one of this, like, I mean, in the title, like, of the presentation, I had charming kernels. So, so this is the charm, this is how we define the charm function. And RBF kernels are really, like, very, very charming kernels. I mean, they're really cool to work with. So what this charm function basically says, so the phi function is the function that defines the kernel. And the charm function, like, is just, I mean, you take pretty much the, uh, I'm here, I, I think there is like a typo, there shouldn't be, this should be like just like a um, derivative with respect to x, and this is the second derivative. So it's just a function of the first and second derivative of the phi function that defines the kernel. Uh, I mean, it's like pretty like a weird expression, so for every RBF kernel you can construct the corresponding charming function, but uh, what it has to do with uh, approximating this kernel. So it turns out that the fact that this Gaussian trick works, in other words, it provides you more accurate estimators than the standard one, comes from the fact that for uh, most RBF kernels, this charming function is actually non-negative. And these are some examples, like some, uh, uh, I mean, plots of the charming function, like, like two-dimensional two space, so it's like pretty toy example, but then we can see how this charm function looks like. And, uh, and interestingly, it's, uh, it's always uh, uh, positive. And as we proved, actually, this is uh, critical. I mean, this charming function needs to be positive in order to get gains. Uh, and also, so you pretty much use two properties. Like one, this like, uh, positive sign of the charming function, and then like this nice connection with completely monotone functions. It turns out that it's, it, 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 turns, it, it seems to be like, very useful. So now, you know, from this plot, the other interesting observation is that, so if you are a practitioner and you would like to use random features because they are simple and uh, I mean you do not need to learn anything, I mean it's just like random projections, and if you use, want to use this orthogonal trick, the question is uh, when you get the largest gains from this orthogonal trick. And it actually tells you, I mean the largest gain will correspond to the largest value of the charming function. So when you have uh, two vectors that are very close to each other, so x and minus y, x minus y is pretty small in terms of the L2 norm, uh, the, the benefits are pretty much uh, uh, insignificant. I mean, the charming function is very close to zero. Uh, but there is this sweet spot where the charming function is pretty large. And actually, interestingly, in our experiments, we saw that this uh, sweet spot corresponds to the setting like where we actually use this, uh, these kernel methods. So 
so basically it's uh, it's surprising that uh, like there like when this charming function should really be larger this is exactly the regime where we would like it to be the largest so you know when the distance between x and y is very large again the charming function is very small but that is pretty fine. I mean, if you have like two vectors that are far away, I mean, obviously, like the, the similarity measure like will be pretty small if you use RBF stuff. So it will be like close to zero. So this is not like a region of interest to you. But the sweet region of interest corresponds actually to, even though we do not have really a formal proof of the sweet uh, region, corresponds to uh, large values of the charming function. Okay, and this is like the corresponding theorem that I do not want us to parse right now because it's actually like pretty crazy. But, uh, but it basically, we have theoretical guarantees right now showing that uh, orthogonal features, or you can think about it in a completely equivalent way, quasi Monte Carlo sampling, sampling with uh, orthogonal Gaussian vectors, or I mean, in general, RBFs in orthogonal vectors, not necessarily Gaussian, outperforms the, the standard one for, I mean, lots of classes of RBF kernels, in particular for Gaussian kernels. And actually, it has something to do with the tails of the Fourier distribution. So the, the heavier the tails are, the less significant the um, gains are. That's why for Laplace or Matern, it actually works worse than for the Gaussian kernel. So with this theorem, and this is what I want to kind of like show you is that, I mean, it's good to be very empirical like in machine learning, but sometimes uh, theory helps because it, it helps you to understand what's going on. I mean, it helps you to understand that if you have like kernel like with corresponding like uh, Fourier uh, measures with very heavy tails, probably uh, that won't give you like much gains. On the other hand, when you use Gaussian kernel, like it makes sense to do this orthogonal trick. And it gives you like also lots of like other uh, interesting properties that you can actually use in practice. I mean, uh, I don't think I have like time right now for it. But, but anyway, it pretty much comes from the observation that the charming, func the charming function is positive and this nice connection with completely monotone function. And this is some examples like uh, for this dimensionality reduction stuff and uh, RBF business. So dimensionality reduction, unstructured Gaussian, the blue line, this is like the baseline, the standard JLT, like the ancient times, like the people like in ancient times, we would do it like with unstructured Gaussian matrices. And then this like different rather marker business, orthogonal business correspond to different structured orthogonal construction. It can be Gaussian orthogonal, it can be something more fancy like um, HD uh, stuff. So, so you basically see that uh, actually if you are interested in dimensionality reduction, it doesn't really make sense to use Gaussian uh, unstructured. You should actually use HD blocks. It's fa there is no reason not to use them. I mean, it's faster. It's a much more compressed mechanism than the standard one and actually more accurate. So why not to use them, right? Um, okay, and this is how some examples like pretty much, I mean, similar business, but for uh, RBF kernels, Gaussian, Matern, and Laplace. So ORF corresponds to orthogonal business, IID is standard baseline, and uh, SOF is pretty much orthogonal structured. So you can use HD matrices instead of Gaussian orthogonal matrices, or um, in, in general, Gaussian matrices. Uh, or orthogonal matrices, sorry. So, so the idea is the same, right? I mean, you get like much more accurate estimators with uh, orthogonal stuff, but uh, I mean, in this setting, the structured discrete stuff does not necessarily work um, that well. I mean, this is like an example right here. The orthogonal Gaussian stuff actually always outperforms the, the unstructured one. So, and again, I mean, it's kind of also from theory. We do not have the theory uh, for um, discrete orthogonal business, like for the RBF setting. We have this theory for the dimensionality reduction setting. Okay, so uh, this is pretty much like the first of the, uh, uh, I mean, uh, end of the first part of the talk. Let me see how much time I have. Okay, I think we are pretty good, actually. Okay, so where those random orthogonal features can be used, right? Because we had like lots of mathematics, but you may think, oh, this is some crazy mathematics and uh, who cares really? So it actually can be used like in many different places. I mean, I, I will show you some cool robotics applications, I promise. Uh, but uh, uh, before I show the school applications, let me show some, some other, like maybe less school applications. So dimensionality reduction we already said, right? I mean, this is you know, probably the first thing we will do, have a very high dimensional data and you would like to do some like reduction to speed up computations. Random feature map for kernel methods, the same, right? If you use kernel methods, I mean, whatever you, uh, I mean, whatever the application is, the standard way to scale kernel methods, because they are not really like very scalable, is to use random features. And when you use random features, if you like to get more accurate estimators, you should use orthogonal random features. And it's like one time extra computation, the worst case scenario, if you use Gaussian orthogonal business, if you use HD business, there is no one time cost. It's actually s uh, faster. Newton sketches for convex optimization. I mean, pretty much any, in any place where you use 
or uh, in the, I mean, in random matrices, you can think about the, uh, doing this orthogonal trick. So this Newton sketches, you can actually use for uh, solving convex problems uh, pretty fast. And again, like in this case, instead of like uh, sketching your matrix using random matrices, you can think about random orthogonal matrices. Quasi Monte Carlo stuff, we talk about it like in the context of, of RBFs. We can think about the RBF as an uh, integral, and then you can think about the quasi Monte Carlo procedure. But uh, if you have Gaussian Hermit quadratures and you are interested like in, in doing uh, uh, accurate approximation, you can use the same trick. So it's really like uh, more than just random features. It's like really quasi Monte Carlo uh, uh, procedure. Compressed sensing, uh, I mean, this is related to uh, dimensionality reduction here, actually. Breaking privacy of databases, I don't have much time to talk about it. Actually, there is also some cool application there. Uh, gradient sensing for black box optimization. So I will talk about it like uh, uh, in a little bit, uh, uh, I mean the next part. But the very rough idea is that, uh, think about the black box function. Uh, it might be the function that takes the parameters of your policy. It might be like a neural network, the weights and basis of the neural network that describe the policy of an agent. And the outcome of the function is the total reward that was uh, I mean, obtained by the agent running this particular policy. And now you are looking for uh, optimal policies. So we'd like to do some like gradient, of, uh, I mean, some optimization with, uh, with gradient sensing. The problem, you cannot do standard back, back, back propagation because it's a really like black box function. So, so one way to do it is to try to sense the, the gradient. And you can actually do it with the use of this uh, orthogonal matrices. I will explain it like um, uh, in a moment. But uh, when you can approximate sense the gradient, then you can actually get, um, I mean, if you can get pretty good signal about the gradient, then you can just plug in any optimization routine that you'd like to have, I mean, stochastic gradient or LBFG, SB or uh, anything else, and hope like that uh, you can get uh, I mean, to some like um, uh, good quality uh, optimum. Uh, so uh, local minimum. So now uh, why it has something to do with this uh, orthogonal business, if you want to sense the gradient, what you can think about it, you can get a bunch of linear measurements. I mean, you can pretty easily by doing like some rollouts like in the simulator, you can get a bunch of linear measurements, I mean dot, dot products like the gradient times like some direction that you choose. So it's really like almost like in the compressed sensing stuff um, scenario where you have like a vector and you would like to recover this vector from the bunch of noisy linear measurements. I mean, this time, the only difference is that probably you do not have information about whether the, the vector is sparse or not. It doesn't have to be sparse necessarily. And it doesn't have to be the, the case that you have this prior information. But, but pretty much from the mathematical point of view, the problem is very similar. You have a bunch of these linear measurements, potentially very noisy measurements, and now, right now you'd like to figure out from these measurements what the gradient is. So the application here would be instead of using, people use like standard and compressed sensing actually for, for that use independent um, Gaussian vector. So we can ag ag again apply this orthogonal trick. The other application is in recurrent neural networks. Uh, actually like we have a recent paper we just like sent for publication. Um, so the idea here is, uh, so it's uh, probably like one of this like coolest like application because it actually shows that orthogonality matters a lot. So the idea is that uh, there is this mechanism called predictive state recurrent neural networks that were actually proposed by researchers from Georgia Tech uh, to doing, I mean, to pr pretty much like do prediction like in the robotics context without like any assumptions about the, the, uh, the environment. So the dynam dynamics of the system is not known. And it's somehow, I mean, it's kind of like it's kernel Bayesian like stuff uh, uh, married with RNN. So in the RNN setting, what they use is actually to initialize their RNN, they use kernel rich regression with like, I mean, Gaussian and standard like RBF kernels. And to make it, to scale it well, they actually use uh, random features. I mean, whenever like use kernel method, you want to like really scale it, and that was the case here, you'd like to use random features. So the, the trick was simple, of course, like use just orthogonal features. And the exam, I mean, the, the results are amazing. So basically what you can see is uh, by doing orthogonal features, you can significantly reduce the number of features that you actually need to get uh, good accuracy. Uh, and so pretty much those orthogonal features are, for, are of much better quality than uh, independent features. So those are different uh, robotic stuff. The swimmer, I mean, uh, stuff is like one task from OpenAI gym. Uh, and it uh, actually turns out that it's much faster, like at the very end, to use this orthogonal stuff because you, you can use like much fewer number of features. Each of them is much of much better quality. <coughs> and as I said, like there is just like a one-time computation of this Gaussian orthogonal matrix or like any other. I mean, if you have like other RBF kernels, the matrix won't be Gaussian, but we will, will be still orthogonal. So it's not really like big pain here, but actually like much more accurate. So 
bunch of bunch of like simple experiments when they just like in the pipelines replace this stuff with orthogonal stuff and and works really very very well. Okay, so let's uh, talk a little bit about uh, so that's the second part of the talk, which is kind of like loosely related to the first one, but uh, but it also kind of like show like how some nice mathematics can be used like in machine learning stuff. So let's talk about this black box optimization via colorful Jacobian sensing. So, so let's think about this reinforcement learning setup. So I mean, even more general setup. So you have like some uh, TensorFlow graph, and you have like some nodes that are possibly like black box nodes. So in other words, you cannot do automatic uh, backpropagation for these nodes. Maybe like some pure Python code, like the output of the simulator, who knows? Some black box stuff. And now you would like to efficiently do backprop like in this entire graph, but somehow deal with, with these black box nodes. So how you can do this backpropagation through these black box nodes? Uh, it seems to be a, a bot bottleneck. So one way to do it is to come up with some efficient procedures for estimating the gradient um, of, of that function, or the Jacobian of that function in the most general setting when you have uh, uh, the function that actually outputs a vector instead of the scalar. So, so now you have a really sensing problem. Of course, the Tricky thing here is that usually, I mean, if you want to sense the gradient or sense the Jacobian, your answers will be pretty noisy, it will be like extra noise. And actually, there is not much that you can assume about this noise. I mean, it's not really like uh, the case that it's like IID, Gaussian, whatever. You can assume something, I mean, about the magnitude, but it can be like highly correlated, whatever. So you should come up like with the procedure that is somehow robust like to, you know, in, in that setting. And also actually pretty, uh, pretty fast. So one example actually of this black box stuff is this reinforcement learning context. So as I said before, in the reinforcement learning context, you can think about the black box function that takes the parameters of the neural network, describe the policy of an agent. And this agent is just, I mean, you run it like in a specific environment. Uh, given these parameters, you get the total reward and that's your black box function, right? So it's from Rn to R where N is the number of all the biases and weights of the neural network. So now you would like to figure out the optimal set of weights and biases, like opt optimize the total reward, like uh, find the optimal policy. So it's kind of like a policy gradient stuff. Uh, without, yeah, so, uh, so that's, that's like one of uh, applications uh, of, this, uh, uh, of this methods that I will present right now. So, okay, so what we can do? So the, there are like a few tricks that you can do. So as I said like before, uh, you can actually think about it uh, from the compressed sensing point of view. So if at any given point you can give me a good approximation of the gradient, that's probably all that I need. Because then I can run like some optimization procedure and hope for the best. So now the question is how you can get this good approximation of the gradient. So if you have a simulator, so you have like an environment like for which you have actually like a good simulator, and we actually like at Google like have like a bunch of like really good simulators for uh, certain like robotics tasks. And also, I mean, if you use OpenAI, Jim, obviously, I mean, you, you work like with, with simulators then. Uh, then what you can do is you can run some number of rollouts and try to get uh, pretty much measure, like sense your gradient, but project your gradient like into the directions that you specify using these rollouts. Um, and, and that's pretty much it. You can collect the batch of measurements and try to do something with this. So from a mathematical point of view, what you actually do is you pretty much uh, create a matrix of directions that you use to project the gradient, and you, what you end up with is the product, this matrix times the gradient. This is like the bunch, I mean, of this like measurements if you use the standard finite different stuff. So now, uh, this is a standard stuff that people like in compressed sensing work on all the time, right? I mean, this setting, as I said, it's not necessarily exactly compressed sensing setting because you do not need to assume that the, I mean, it doesn't, uh, it, it's not reasonable to assume that uh, your uh, gradient vector is necessarily sparse. But, uh, I mean, there are lots of techniques that, uh, I mean, were developed like in compressed sensing that actually work also like when you do not have uh, much assumptions about the, the vectors that uh, you sense with those random matrices. So, so that's like the standard way to, uh, to do it. So you can collect a bunch of measurements and, uh, and then you have this compressed sensing problem. When you have a compressed sensing problem, I mean, the standard thing to do is to uh, use some like LP, right? I mean, like, uh, there is like the standard like algorithm, like a very simple like LP program that you can actually solve. And uh, you can prove that if each of these measurements is perturbed by noise, and this noise is not necessarily Gaussian, doesn't have to be IID, it's pretty much an adversarial noise. As long as uh, the magnitude is within some range, with very high probability with respect to the choices of the entries of this uh, random matrix, you will actually recover a very good approximation of the gradient in terms of the L2 norm. 
So that's a very nice thing that, that you can do, and actually this is what we, what we did, like this is our other NIFS paper. Uh, but there is even more general procedures. So instead of like thinking about LP, you can actually think about this optimization problem. So it's a convex optimization problem when J is the Jacobian, and uh, let's forget about D core right now, let's just focus on the D matrix. So D is a matrix of directions on which you project your gradient basically by doing this finite different stuff. So you get a bunch of measurements, uh, are pretty much like noisy uh, projections of the gradient vector on those directions that you choose, and you choose those directions as random Gaussian directions usually. So these are the measurements that you get from finite different stuff, and this is the optimization problem that you try to solve. The D core stuff corresponds to the fact that in practice, if you know something about the structure of the Jacobian, you can actually compress this optimization problem. I mean, it works, you can solve it even without any compression, but it turns out that if you know some prior knowledge, you have some prior knowledge about the structure, you can take advantage of that. So what this prior knowledge can be, one way to uh, emulate, I mean, to mo model it is to say, okay, let's just take our Jacobian, and if we know that all the non-zero entries are in this blue region, but we don't know exactly what those non-zero entries are, then we can somehow take advantage of the fact uh, that we know something about the location of this non-zero entries of the Jacobian. In some robotics applications, actually this is the case, you can predict it pretty accurately, to compress the problem, how you do it. So you take this, this is actually like pretty nice because uh, that is what, uh, I mean, finally like an application of some nice, uh, I mean, combinatorial graph theory in machine learning that I, I managed to, to find after like a few years. So, so it, it was lots of fun. So, so the idea is very simple. So what you can do is you can construct the so-called I mean, intersection graph for that Jacobian. So the idea is that uh, the nodes of that graphs are the columns of the Jacobian. And you put an edge between two nodes if and only if the following holds. So basically you take two columns of the Jacobian and you look like into the row that will intersect those two columns in entries that are both blue. If this is the case, then you put an edge. If this is not the case, then you put a non-edge. So this is how you define the intersection graph. So it turns out that if you can color the intersection graph efficiently, then you can actually reduce the uh, complexity of your optimization problem. It basically turns out that the optimal coloring, or I mean good quality coloring um, of that intersection graph will give you a way to agglomerate the variables that you have like in that problem and come up with the lower dimensional problem instead of the initial n dimensional problem when n is the number of the, of the variables that you have, you can end up with chi of g dimensional problem if chi of g is the chromatic number of the intersection graph that you work with. So the better like quality coloring you, you get, the, the better compression you have. And the nice thing is that like in practice, I mean, if you have this prior knowledge, it's usually the intersection graph, I mean, will be like pretty sparse. So, I mean, you do not need, I mean, the coloring problem is NP hard, but you do not need to do like, I mean, uh, 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 do like any crazy thing about the coloring. I mean, usually like very greedy procedures uh, that we all very know, uh, well, uh, know very well, like in this department, like uh, work pretty well. So, you know, we can pretty much like one like critical cool procedure is you can order the vertices uh, in a, random manner, but in such a way that uh, pretty much uh, the vertices with higher degree uh, are like uh, before the degrees, is, uh, degrees uh, uh, vertices with lower degree. And then you can just do brute force like coloring. So take the next vertex like in the sequence and color with the next available color and actually it works pretty well. So as I said, I want to emphasize, even if you do not have this prior knowledge and very often you do not have, I mean, in the stream involvement learning setup, like when we have the gradient vector, who knows like whether it's sparse or not we do not really uh, take any prior knowledge here, you can still solve this convex optimization problem, but there is like this nice extra stuff uh, that you can actually do if you have some extra information. So, so that's this, uh, the most general convex problem that you work with, and as I said, uh, I mean, for particular values of P, it kind of, I mean, collapses to very speci special cases. So if you take P equals one or plus infinity, you actually end up with the linear program, and this is basically very much related to compressed sensing stuff. Uh, if you end up with P equals two, you actually end up with uh, uh, linear regression, which actually works uh, well under some assumptions about the noise. But we had like some tests where actually noise didn't follow this assumption and then like it really like, uh, I mean it really like struggled. So then the fact that the LP is robust, like I mean doesn't really assume anything about the structure of the noise other than like we, it has to be within some magnitude, it's actually very useful. So adversarial noise, and actually like some of these tricks are used like on a regular basis uh, by people from, I mean, database community because they're like super interesting when they talk about algorithms breaking privacy, 
Of course, there are interests like in the setting when you have like an adversarial, al I mean, algorithm that is like doing some crazy addition of the noise before like publishing the, the data. So this is an adversarial noise setting. Like people like in database community are interested like in the adver adversarial noise setting. And actually like some of these tricks that they use can be applied directly here. Those are pretty cool. So this decor stuff is obtained from this original matrix of uh, uh, random directions by pretty much agglomerating uh, using like those color classes that were defined by the intersection graph. Okay, and these are like some examples like how it works in practice. So what we have here is, uh, so in this like first plot, we have a CNN when we replace like one of the layer by this black box layer, where we pretty much like added like some artificial noise and used like a bunch of our techniques. So it turns out that, uh, so the rainbow algorithm is this like algorithm that, uh, that we developed like this, this general um, convex optimization business. You can do uh, linear regression. So that basically corresponds to the special case P equals two, or you can do standard finite difference for sensing the gradient. I mean, that is like the ancient method uh, that you will use to, to do that. And it turns out actually that uh, uh, under Noise, this, this is like the best thing to do. You can actually, you, you need this, like solving this LP program gives you like much better convergence than actually like linear regression or, or finite difference. So it has something to do, I mean the theory says that it's robust to noise and actually uh, it works also like in practice. Now, you know, if you, this, this corresponds to structured like LP regression, which also like in many cases works reasonably well. The structure basically, what I mean by structured, so, it basically means that the matrix that you use like for, for doing like this regression is a structured uh, Gaussian matrix. So it's not really, uh, in this case, it's actually a circulant matrix. Why you would like to use uh, circulant matrices in this setting? Because uh, then at some point, like you need to invert like these matrices and um, inverting like a circulant matrix can be done in a uh, subcubic time actually. So this is how you can take advantage like of some like extra structure in the problem. Of course, uh, a circulant matrix is not an independent matrix, so that will possibly should hurt the performance, but actually in practice it does not. So it's just faster and, uh, uh, and, and, and as accurate and the unstructured baseline. So now, uh, one more thing I would like to comment on. So in this case, you can actually also take uh, epsilon equals zero, and that really corresponds to solving a linear system with random matrices. And uh, actually, like very often, that is the fastest way in which you can uh, sense this gradient. Uh, is if this uh, random matrix is actually like of the form HD, 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 and something like this, we are talking about it a few minutes ago in terms of, I mean, in the context of the Michelter reduction, then, I mean, inverting the HD matrix is, is trivial. I mean, it's uh, pretty much the inverse of the H matrix is one over N times H. So, I mean, there's nothing for you to really do. And it actually corresponds to really computing the, I mean, if you think about it from the mathematical point of view and we write this linear system, I mean, solve this linear system for this HD matrices, it really corresponds to something, uh, I mean, approximate quantum, uh, quasi, I mean, quasi Monte Carlo approximation of the uh, gradient of the Gaussian smoothing of a function. So, so when we had actually like first like uh, reviews like of the, uh, I mean, for NIPS, before this, I mean, the orbital season opened, one of the reviewers said, okay, like, I mean, it's like really cool, but uh, what if the function that you are really optimizing is not differentiable? I mean, you're computing some gradients, but I mean, what if the gradient does not exist? I mean, what are you doing then, really? And I mean, it's like CNN setting, like, I mean, definitely, like, like use ReLU, I mean, this is not differentiable, right? So, so what are we doing there, right? So, uh, is this crap? No, actually, it's not. And, uh, uh, and then the answer is like actually pretty cool. So, you can actually prove that what we are doing in that context is uh, really approximating this uh, uh, Gaussian, the gradient of the Gaussian smoothing of the function. And uh, I mean, that will always like exist. And actually, the Gauss, Gaussian smoothings, I mean, it's like a way to deal with like functions that are not differentiable in this optimization like scenario. So, so it's a very, very nice uh, context because um, it's kind of like a quasi Monte Carlo estimator. If you look exactly on the form of the Gaussian smoothing and the gradient of the Gaussian smoothing, and it's given by the integral. I mean, kind of like a very similar structure to the structure that we have for the RBF kernel and for the Gaussian kernel. So now you can really do this approximation with Gaussian independent vectors. You can do this approximation with Gaussian orthogonal vectors. And you can actually do this approximations with this like HD vectors, which is exactly what we are doing if we solve this linear system with HD matrices. And the idea here is that if you have a row of the HD matrix, it's kind of like a random rotation, but it's not like truly random. It's not like you are really sampling from the hard distribution on a sphere. And it's kind of like doing some discrete approximation of that. 
So, so it's not exactly, I mean, a random rotation, but it's kind of like a pseudo-random rotation. It's actually good for us. We want this pseudo-randomness because it gives you speed up. But on the other hand, uh, we would like to have good accuracy. And you can actually show that, uh, I mean, there are like some nice like, theorems that you can prove about it. The, the rows of that matrix are kind of like resemble the, 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 the Gaussian like vectors. So, so it's kind of like a faster version of the Gaussian vector. And obviously when n goes to infinity, it kind of like, uh, it's, it, it looks more like, a, more like a Gaussian vector. So it's just like a nice trick that, that works pretty well. Yeah, so, okay, so there is also some nice uh, theory for that. Uh, yeah, maybe let's not parse this, uh, this stuff uh, at this point. But, uh, but what I want to basically say is that uh, if we use this LP approach for gradient sensing, you can actually prove a lot about, uh, uh, I mean, the accuracy of this gradient estimation. Of obviously, I mean, in general, of the Jacobian estimation. So, I mean, one way to measure is it to show that with some high probability, one minus some negligible function of your, the size of the input, uh, the Jacobian, the ground truth Jacobian, is not far away in terms of the Frobenius norm from like what you actually re uh, uh, retrieved by using like this LP stuff. And, and that's pretty much like what this theorem says. Uh, you can take advantage of this prior knowledge and compress the problem if you have this prior knowledge. If you do not have this prior knowledge, you just don't do this. Uh, the other thing is that it's kind of really like uh, robust to noise. So the only thing that we assume about the noise, I mean, it's pretty much right here. So this eta infinity is O of En. So it basically says, so this is like some function of n, uh, and uh, we do not assume anything about the IID of this stuff, we do not assume that it's Gaussian or whatever, so it's just something about the L infinity norm, and actually even this can be relaxed. So by using some results from compressed sensing, we can actually show that if I tell you that, let's say 20% of those measurements are completely off, the error is like whatever you want to add, but the 80% are within this like error like eta of like some like reasonable magnitude, then you can still show that with very high probability, one minus some negligible function of the size of your problem, you will recover a good approximation of the gradient. So, so that's actually like pretty, pretty nice. And I promise you, I mean, uh, it's, uh, I'm in a robotics team, so it was lots of mathematics here, but I want to show you that this mathematics works in practice. It's not just mathematics for mathematics, but, uh, but actually works in practice. So what we did is basically here we, this is our, I mean you see it's our, I mean I will show you the video, uh, uh, our doc, I mean the mini tower, like it's pretty cute actually. And so what he can do, like he can walk, he can turn like pretty much like done for, I mean used for navigation stuff. I mean we would like it to, I mean grab some like sandwiches for us, like and uh, for lunch, I mean he still doesn't do it but uh, he's working on that. So, but th the point is that you can actually, uh, so in this context, we want to teach him how to walk. So we can like simulate this stuff in our simulator. And what we can do is, uh, so it's kind of like a black box stuff, right? So we have like a neural network. I mean, in this context, actually, that was um, even simpler because we have a kind of like an open loop policy business. So the, the movements of the leg was encoded by some sine and cosine waves. And it was just like a matter of finding a bunch of like seven or nine parameters that were encoding like this, this movement. And, uh, but this is like still like black box function settings. So you kind of like, we can think about it almost like hyperparameter tuning, but you want to do it like by, by using like this infrastructure. So you have like this, uh, the bunch of these magical parameters that you would like to find optimal values of. And the output of the black box function is the number of meters that the, the Minotaur like, uh, uh, you know, uh, traversed or, uh, it's actually a, more, a little bit more complicated because you do not want it to be too shaky. I mean, it's like the, the, the reward function is like um, uh, a little bit more complicated, but roughly speaking, it's driven by, I mean, you'd like to travel fast in a pretty robust way. It's not just about traveling. You can like uh, um, uh, encode like um, rewards, like when you want the minute out to rotate, uh, I mean, change directions, whatever, and still like use the same stuff. So in this case, we used like our Hadamard stuff, like pretty much like solving this linear system with Hadamard business, which is pr pretty much quasi Monte uh, Carlo approximation of the Gaussian the gradient of the Gaussian smoothing of the function to to teach him like how to do this navigation. And and, and this is the video, and this is pretty much the end of the of the talk. So this is how how it works. So this is like in the simulation. And this is in our lab. And uh, and like one more example, like the, the, the rotation stuff, and it's our lab. And actually we did it test, this test like early in the morning. We did not want to scare people. And uh, so it was like 6 or 7 a.m. Uh, and we got like pretty, 
uh, nice space for, for that. So I think that's it on my side. Uh, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer. And uh, as I said at the beginning, it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. Thank you.